Hello everybody and welcome back to Witch Fix. Today we're looking at another book by Sarah Addison Allen. This is the sequel to Garden Spells, which I read a long time ago. Uh, but you don't really need to remember that much about the first book if you're going to read this one because it handily does inform you basically every step of the way about what happened in that first book. So very minimally was I confused by developments in the meantime. Now First Frost is the name of this novel and I'm going to quickly read you the blurb. It is thus. As temperatures drop and leaves begin to fall from the trees in Bascom, North Carolina, the Waverly women grow restless. They give their hearts away too easily and are distracted by silver-eyed strangers and make curious mistakes. When an unexpected visitor shows up and challenges the very heart of their family, it becomes even more difficult to remain level-headed. Everything should improve after the first frost of the season. Then their mischievous apple tree will blossom at last, and the magic that swirls around it can find a proper home. But as sisters Claire and Sydney Waverley, and Sydney's 15-year-old daughter Bay, are forced to make choices they have never confronted before, can they hold their family together until the extraordinary event? This year, First Frost has a lot in store. So this book takes place around 10 years after the first one. In the first novel, you might remember, Sydney and her five-year-old daughter, Bay escaped from Sydney's ex and they moved back to Bascom uh, to be with Claire and to basically rekindle the relationship between Claire and Sydney. It was essentially Practical Magic, the movie, but novelised, uh, not to do it down in any way, but that's obviously what the plotline mostly reminded me of. And all the sisters, uh, both of the sisters and all the other Waverleys, I should say, had their own unique gifts. So Sydney, she could tell anything about somebody by their hair and could affect their lives by cutting and styling and just generally being a hairdresser. So could give them good luck or, or various other things. Claire's skills were more culinary. She could create magical dishes that would cause a, a sensation at parties and impart various magical qualities. Bay had the gift of knowing where people belonged, where things belonged. She could put things away in houses she'd never been to before and knew that someone didn't fit in in, in the, their current existence, in their current life. Uh, so that power is very much still present. We also have new characters because it's it's been 10 years since the original book. Chiefly, we have the husbands who were boyfriends in, in the previous novel. So Sydney has married Henry, uh, a guy from a local family, and Claire has married Tyler, an artist. They don't feature hugely in the book, but they are there. Also, Claire now has a daughter, Mariah, who is still quite young and isn't around much in the book but again does feature in it and one of the little mysteries in the book is what Mariah's gift is going to be because outwardly she doesn't seem very waverly at all she seems to be 100% normal and that's another big theme in the book um, basically I would guess like the core thing for Claire as her storyline is her questioning whether being a waverly means actually being magical and whether it's just a series of stories her grandmother invented to make her and her sister feel better for being outcasts. I will say that there isn't a huge amount in doubt about that because although she could question whether her food is actually magical, there is an apple tree in the garden that does throw apples at people uh, and various other magical things do happen that are kind of not explainable by mundane sources. So although I kind of got that she was questioning herself it didn't make a huge amount of sense to me that she would ever seriously think that she wasn't magical. But Claire's storyline is basically that since the first novel, she started a candy making business. And this has taken off to the extent she doesn't have time for anything else. And so she has stopped using uh, ingredients from the Waverly Garden for her candies, but no one has noticed. And so she starts questioning whether there was anything magical about them to begin with, if she can just stop using the supposedly magic plants to make them and also she's concerned about her, her daughter not having any Waverly gifts. Sydney's storyline is that she wants another child, uh, Bay is now 15, she wants to have a baby with her new husband and isn't able to get pregnant so she's kind of struggling with that and, and with being Bay's mother in general uh, and the challenges of having a teenager now um it kind of reminded me a lot of the lollipop shoes this go around because you have these kind of questions about whether magic is really real and how difficult motherhood is and also the introduction of a character threatening to rip it all apart by being a con man 
So um, th there's a new character. He shows up in town with a mysterious suitcase uh, and proceeds to state that he's going to blackmail somebody. And for the longest time, it's kind of up in the air as to who he's going to blackmail. But it becomes quite obvious as you're reading the book that it's Claire, because obviously Claire has this new candy fame and candy money coming in. So he's going to try and blackmail her. Now, everything that I liked about the original Garden Spells book is still true about this one. The writing is lovely. It's very evocative. All the little touches of everyday magic are still in there to make it a uh, very um, magical realism. So if you like books like Chocolat, films like Practical Magic, you're definitely going to love this book and its predecessor. The thing that annoyed me about the original book a little bit was that they built up Sidney's ex as being kind of the main antagonist. But then he was dealt with very quickly. And the same thing happens in this book. This blackmailing guy is built up as if he's going to eventually cause a serious problem for the sisters. But again, he is dealt with within literally like seven pages and ceases to be a problem. However, in this book, it didn't really annoy me that much because when he laid out his full blackmail plan to Claire... I was unimpressed and I felt that she would be an idiot if she were to give him any money because he really didn't have anything to blackmail her with. He had some nasty surprises and so-called secrets which did, question, uh, did call into question her uh, attachment to the family, her legitimacy, but nothing that would be a serious threat to her business or any of the other things he wanted to paint it as. So I initially got a little bit annoyed with her for thinking that she had to pay him off because although obviously what he said was upsetting to her on a personal level, it wasn't in any way defamatory or something that would ruin her business. And then her family come in and react like it's not a big deal. It can be just laughed off, which didn't feel right to me because obviously she's very upset by this and I felt like they should take that seriously and comfort her on that score. But again, nothing that's really seriously a threat to the business. So I was kind of glad that this wasn't given a huge amount of time in the book because honestly, it didn't seem like it was a big deal, to be honest. It serves as a way to like develop the story to release secrets, uh, but it's not really like an antagonist move. I think I said before um, when I was reviewing... Uh, Sugar Queen that there was quite a lot in the plot that was very predictable. This book kind of falls into those same lines. There are a lot of things that are very predictable but it's still kind of nice to have them confirmed at the end. So for example the whole secret that Claire is being so-called blackmailed with that's quite predictable. The whole idea that Mariah isn't developing a Waverly power but at the same time now does have a sudden friend called M, like E-M, who has just appeared from nowhere and who no one has ever met. Obviously, it's an imaginary friend. Obviously, that means that she's probably seeing some sort of ghost. And they do talk an awful lot about Grandmother Mary, from which you can all draw your own conclusions, I'm sure. Likewise, Sydney is struggling to get pregnant, struggling to have a child, and just happens to have a receptionist at her hair salon, who is just like Sydney was when she was younger, i.e. desperate to get out of town and filled with poor life decisions but she also has a baby son who Sydney is completely enamoured with so it's kind of wildly obvious where that kid is going to end up by the end of the book but I think it's one of those cases of the destination is kind of known you can predict that it's getting there that's the enjoyable part of the book watching the characters develop and interact and discover things about themselves that's sort of why we're here we're not here because any of this stuff is going to be very surprising or mysterious something that i was really grateful for is that bay doesn't fall into the same sort of teenage trap as what happened in the lollipop shoes with anuk where anuk became just the stereotypical teenager who didn't want to listen to anybody and was always really antagonistic. You know, the Dawn Summers approach to teenagering. But she is basically the same character she always was, but now a little bit more grown up, which is generally what happens when people get older. So although there are some moments where she's obviously going against her mother's wishes and sneaking out in the middle of the night, it's not done in that sort of face palming why are you being so fucking stupid kind of sense of character development you can understand every step of the way why she's doing what she's doing and her relationship with her mother does remain 
basically solid so that's not playing for extra angst i think basically my takeaway from all of the plot lines is that they were all handled really well and steered away from pitfalls where i would have been you know screwing up my face a little bit and being like oh i've definitely read this elsewhere now having said all those positive things about the book there are a couple of things that annoyed me and that is mostly to do with the fact that they raised these mysteries about grandmother mary who was not previously discussed very much in garden spells but is referred to a lot through this book and they even find one of her cooking journals that has been mysteriously completely red acted and seems to refer to a guy called carl who is um their mother's biological father so i guess their grandfather even though he took off before their mother was born it seems like there's going to be a mystery here we're going to find out a little bit about their mum, a little bit about her dad and where he came from and then maybe a little bit about Sydney and Claire's fathers because they have different dads and it, it's kind of this mystery of like where they've come from and I realised that the concern of the Waverleys is basically all about the women the husbands even at the family gatherings kind of stay off to one side and let the women get on with the magical shit but it is kind of a mystery it's kind of up in the air there are other families in the area and in the book who do have magical powers so it'd be interesting if these Waverly women were also related to their other families. I thought we were going to get a little bit more of that mystery, but then we're just told at the end, uh, via some spiritual, spiritual ghosty stuff, not to worry about that book because the grandmother just redacted it because she fell out of love with Carl when he left. And there's nothing else in there of any importance, which feels a little bit lazy. Uh, this book on Goodreads is marked as like Waverly Sisters 2. I'm really hoping there's going to be a Waverly Sisters 3. This book came out in 2015. The original came out in 2007. So obviously a big gap there. I kind of understand that because the author had written a lot of other books in that time. Um, but yeah, seven years, eight years later, we got this second part. And I'm really hoping for like a third part that maybe unravels some of those greater mysteries about the Waverly family's history, about Lorelai, their mum, about their grandmother, because it feels a little bit like that mystery was kind of small and scaled down, but in actuality it still feels like there's a lot more stuff that we don't know about. So in a way it feels like we've discovered the first part of the mystery, but not been fully led into the real history behind this family. And I would maybe like kind of a prequel book, um, just tying this back into that whole like practical magic series again that got a prequel so i feel like this one has more than enough legs on it which makes it sound like a creepy insect but that it could have a prequel maybe a, a side book offshoot about other characters that would be quite interesting in the version of the book that i have there is like a secret chapter 17 which apparently was printed in like this version um, I guess maybe the paperback version and not in the original, uh, which deals with one of the other side characters in the book, Annie Ainsley, who works at a hotel run by her brother where the con man stays for the duration of the book. And she forms a relationship with him. And in the end, they disappear to the same place. But, but then he goes off and leaves her again. She's not like in love with him or anything, but it sort of seeks to... I guess free her from the town at the same time as he is leaving the thing about his character is you don't really get a huge amount about it he remains largely an unknown quantity you get to know a little bit about his history but not a huge amount about his whole purpose for being where he's gone i guess because in the end he's not really that important the story is mostly about the waverly sisters and also i guess latterly about annie um, Annie in the last chapter of the book runs into the girl who gave up her baby in like a, a general dollar store and it's sort of heavily implied from how that girl is acting that she might be on drugs or having some sort of other issue because she seems to have like the jitters she's shaking she's asking strangers for money you know things are not going very well for her and then the book just ends but she also shows her the picture of her son to Annie and explains that Sydney is just looking after him for her. So there's kind of an implication there that eventually she's going to end up back in town looking for her son. So 
again, I think a third book would really help there because at the moment it just seems like Sydney has her kid and now this poor girl's gone off to like die somewhere. It it just doesn't feel like a very rounded ending. It feels more like a lead into another book, um, which obviously hasn't been forthcoming in the last five years. So I hope it does come out eventually that we revisit this. Um, but yeah, it was a good book. I did enjoy it as a follow up to Garden Spells. I didn't think I was going to. I think I said in my original review that Garden Spells felt like a very final closed ending and I didn't really get where the characters could go after that. But the themes that they look about uh, look at in terms of like family and belonging in this book really do kind of naturally grow out of that first one. And it was very enjoyable. A lot of the magic stuff is still in there, which I really like. Uh, and I'm interested to look at some of this author's other books because... I mean, the Sugar Queen had some magic in it, but I feel like this two book series has had the most. But I'll be interested in looking at some of the other novels to see if they are as magical realism y or maybe even more so. So, my final takeaway is that Garden Spells and First Frost, excellent pair of books to read if you really like the practical magic movie, if you're really into like the Chocolat books and other sort of magical realism things like the other Joanne Harris books that she's written, anything that's to do with sort of food, magic, very sensory writing style, definitely grab these books. Um, Sarah Addison Allen, definitely one of my favourite authors that I've found through the podcast. So take that for what it's worth and do get in touch if you have any other recommendation of books that are like this because I could really see myself getting down at a rabbit hole of finding other books in this sort of cosy genre of magical realism cooking feminine relationships sisterhood that kind of thing I really like it uh, don't forget to get in touch if you have found copies like that and definitely get in touch if you have opinions on Garden Spells and First Frost, if you enjoyed them, if you didn't, let me know. Uh, but otherwise, I will see you in the next episode.